welcome to another episode of Words with Friends. This is the start of a brand new season and I couldn't think of anybody better to kick off this season as we look at some of the critical conversations that we should be having, we need to be having, and we need to be able to learn from. I couldn't think of anybody better than my dear friend, Mr. Tony Chapman. Trusted by not only government organizations, government associations, and some of the world's biggest brands to understand how they can navigate complex conversations, deal with things like diversity, understand more about the complexities of relationships, both in workplaces and in their personal lives. Tony is somebody that I've had the privilege of not only being able to admire his work from a distance, but lean into his friendship as we've got to know each other through the National Speakers Association and being hanging out and, and maybe even sharing a thought or two about bourbon over time. So, so Tony, welcome to the show. Great to be able to have you here right now. Hey, thanks, Phil, for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Words With Friends is simple, right? We're gonna jam out a conversation. We're gonna talk about a single word. I did tell you a word ahead of time and it's kind of an obvious one for you knowing the body of work that you have. But if people don't know your work, why do you think I might've chosen for us to talk about the word bias today? I would assume that you've chosen that word because I've almost become synonymous with that word in recent times. I've worked with the Department of Homeland Security, a number of law enforcement agencies, another, uh, another number of federal agencies, just kind of all around the world, uh, even to the point where I've been partnering with the National Science Foundation to really discuss not only you know, what bias is and how it you know, performs within our regular lives, but you know, what can we actually do to mitigate it on an individual level and on an organizational level and hopefully eventually on a societal level. One of the things I've always loved about listening to you talk about some of these very deep and difficult topics is, is your ability to approach it from a 360 degree point of view, your ability to be able to actually then allow others to be able to change their perspective in the way that they've gone and, and, and seen a situation. Now, when did you first realize that this whole topic of bias was something that you cared passionately enough about to make it your profession? Well, that's fascinating. So I've been a speaker a lot longer than I've been a speaker who speaks on bias. You know, my college upbringing, my college training was in chemical engineering, worked in nonprofit, went to grad school, University of Chicago, all that fun stuff. When I began speaking, I was really pushing more towards leadership and communication and how to navigate disruption and change. And truthfully, I tried to stay clear of bias and anything having to do with diversity and inclusion. And the simple fact is because of what bias really is. As a black speaker, it is expected that at some point I am to talk about diversity. It's just, and it's a, it's a weird thing. If I tell people I talk about leadership, just the average person on the street, they'll start to ask me, so what makes you qualified? And you know, they want me to go through this litany of things that's in my resume. If I tell them I speak on bias, they're like, oh, of course. It's just this expectation. So I honestly just didn't want to be pigeonholed. I didn't want to deal with it. I've, I've been the only black navigating white spaces the majority of my adult life. And it was just a burden I didn't want to take on. And then Trayvon Martin was killed and George Zimmerman was found innocent. And that was, it was eye-opening in a way to see people's response because growing up I, I just always figured the issue with people is they don't see it they don't get a chance to visually see what is the norm and i'm going to say it in this way for black people they just don't get to see it and if they saw it then they would get it because they're human and they're empathetic and in that moment, I realized that's not the case. That's, that there's, there's something way more. And I had been studying bias on my own, but you know, that was a moment where I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not an activist. I'm not an organizer. But I can't sit back and do nothing. And then I'm watching this kind of play out more and I'm watching Michael Brown and I'm watching you know, Ferguson, Missouri and, you know, and I'm, I'm still turning down clients who are asking me to talk about diversity. I hadn't figured out what it was. And finally, I had a conversation with a client who's like, we really want you. We, we, people need to hear your voice. And I said, 
I'll do it, but it's got to be on my terms and my conditions. And you have to assure me that you're not just checking a box because I'm not going to waste my time and my energy. And, you know, from there, honestly, it exploded. They, they told another one of my clients and, and I got to the point where I was doing about 60% of my work on unconscious bias before I'd even updated my website. It was just, it, it literally, I think I caught, I was at that right moment in the right wave. And I, and because I pursued it from a scientific standpoint, as well as from a human standpoint, it seemed to resonate in a way that, you know, it doesn't necessarily for everyone else who does it. So that became it. And, you know, a lot of my fears were found to be true. I've been pigeonholed uh, by clients, by speakers, you know, it's, People view me as the diversity guy. And, but you know, at this point, I'm more concerned. You know, you and I think we, we, we have these conversations all the time. So we're just letting people into our conversation. We're, we're both at stages of our life where, yeah, we want success, but we want to make a difference. And we want yeah. to feel good about what we've accomplished. And we can sacrifice some money to do that. And if it works out financially and great, but sleeping, going to bed at night and being able to look yourself in the mirror and feel good about yourself is more than a few extra dollars. And you know, that's how it goes. So we're talking bias. I'm wondering if it means different things to different people. So tell me this is what is a Tony Chapman definition of the word bias? All right. So first, most people, when they think of bias, they think of, prejudice in some form or fashion, right? It's racism, it is homophobia, xenophobia, misogyny. When I think of bias, here's what I think of. All of us have a methodology for making decisions. We have, you know, I come from an engineering background, so I have a very specific way because of how I've been trained to making decisions. What biases are to me is their algorithms and their faults in the algorithm of how we make decisions. That when we think we're being subjective, we're really not. That when we think that we're looking at the whole picture, we're really being far more myopic than we think. That, you know, and because of that definition, it doesn't just apply to when people see you and I and they see our skin color differences, it applies to how we look at news. It actually applies to how we look at data. It applies to everything that there are flaws in our decision-making process that we may be aware of and we may not be aware of, but they keep us from being accurate and objective. So give me some everyday examples, everyday examples that people would understand that maybe are examples of bias that they haven't considered for themselves, but would help them see for themselves that they have these traits. Sure. Everyday examples. You walk down the street, you see someone, you have a first impression of them, and you decide they're safe. You decide they're safe based on evidence you don't have. You may decide that they're safe because they look like you. You know, you may decide they're safe because they're pretty. You, you go in to hire somebody, and it's a fascinating thing. What will go way beyond race and everything. You're a hiring professional and you go to hire someone and they really connect with you and you just get this great feeling about they're gonna be the perfect person for the job. Well, it's probably because they're more like you. They may be more data oriented like you are or they may be more extroverted than you are. And it's not that they're the best fit for the job, it's because they, for some reason, convinced you that you like them. And so you take that like and you project it into your decision-making process. It could be, <laughs> could be a police officer walking down the street and seeing a black man pull out a cell phone and thinking it's a gun because in his mind, he already has decided or she has decided that black people are more dangerous than white people. And so if they're reaching for something, it must be a weapon. It could be, it could be me going to the Brooklyn bar convention, which you, we, you and I have to go to one day, by the way. It's yeah, yeah we got to do that. It's, dude, let me explain the bar convention of Brooklyn. 
uh, most people here have gone to conventions before. So I went to see a good friend of mine speak and he invited me, so I got a pass in and you go in. Now picture the exhibit hall, every booth is an open bar. That's <laughs> the bar, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So I go to the bar convention of Brooklyn wearing actually this exact shirt and I see my friend, we hug each other and right, right after that moment, someone walks up to me and says, uh, oh, excuse me, there's been a spill. Can you clean it up over there? Assuming that because I'm black, I must be, you know, part of maintenance. So, you know, th those are some of the ways there. There's so many other ways. There's the assumption that because I'm black, maybe my parents aren't educated, although both of my parents went to college. There could be the assumption that because someone's a woman in a high position that she got in there because of affirmative action versus because she's earned the right to get in there. It could be, you know, you start to break it down. There's so many ways, but it just, what's fascinating is functional MRIs have shown us more than 50% of the decisions we make on a daily basis are done from our subconscious and not our conscious minds. And so we're not nearly as objective as we think. We're not nearly as, you know, we, we think we're, <laughs> you'll, you'll get this. The majority of people think they're smarter than average. Right? That's statistically <laughs> impossible, right? <laughs> that's, that can't be, but you know, that's reality. So. so what we're seeing is this, this bias thing is everywhere. I just want to just check something in the other direction because I'm interested. Is you said earlier on, the, earlier on in your career, when you would explain to people in the, in the street that you were a leadership expert that spoke on leadership topics, and people would ask you the question of, you know, who qualified you for that? What was your inherent bias around why they were asking that question? You know, initially I didn't have one. I didn't even think about it. And that's the funny thing. Often when you're the victim of bias, you don't realize it in the moment. You, you just, okay. I just rolled with it. I'm like, oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then after I started to see a pattern, then I started to think, why does this pattern exist? And I think that's what happens to a lot of people. So you know, I, I have to be honest, most of the time it just, I didn't even catch me off guard. I just answered the question. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got really involved with bias and realized nobody ever asked me what qualified me to talk about diversity and inclusion that I started going back and saying, okay, now here's a different pattern. Why does that exist? Right. See, the re I, I guess another reason I ask it is I've been asked the same question a number of times through my career and, and, and always questioned whether that discrimination was through a age discrimination, et cetera, at the time is um, I held senior leadership positions from a very young age, often looked a lot younger than where I was. And when I would tell people what I did for a living, people would be surprised and then they would question it and they, or they would say, where did you go to school? Right. And I, and I don't have a college education and, and, and would feel this giant need to be able to defend it. Now, in my opinion on what I've got on to better learn is my scenario is very different to the bias that you were facing. Um, why? why? Why is there a difference in some mild discrimination than an overarching bias? Or why is there a difference between somebody who jumps to a, an unknown conclusion because it doesn't fit into a normality and an overarching bias that, 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 that drives a you know, a more violent or a, a more prejudiced decision? One is frequency, right? Okay. I mean, there are certain things that just happen to everybody. Yep. And, you know, the, the tendency could be to think, well, you're saying this happened to you. Well, heck, I've gone through that. But if you've right. gone through that <laughs> two or three times in your life and I go through it biweekly, there's a difference in frequency. And Huge then it difference. becomes, yeah, it's like Ling Chi, right? Death by a thousand cuts. It's, it's that you know, that just builds up and is cumulative, that becomes part of it. I think it also has to be framed with, it's coupled with large biases, right? So, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about, you know, the time that, you know, I, I got funny looks when I was getting ready to come to a, <laughs> when I was walking up to a client at a speaking gig because clearly they never looked at my website and didn't know I was black, right? So that's, your fault, but you know, that's one thing. That's very different 
than the time when I was in college. And my boss and I, we'd gone from Charlotte, North Carolina to Atlanta. You know, we were out late. He was too drunk to drive. And so you know, I'm the college intern. I'm driving us back through the middle of Georgia. We stop at a Waffle House to get him some coffee. And we get back on the road. And I even remember being in Waffle House, seeing this police car come into the, the parking lot and circle around. We get back into the car. We get about a mile away from the Waffle House in the middle of nowhere. And the police officer stops us, has me get out of the car. And then outside of the car tells me that the car I'm driving has been reported stolen and that, you know, I'm going to jail. And, you know, reflexively, I was like, wait, 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 this is because, you know, this is my boss's car. It's actually his company car. And he's sitting in the passenger seat. And I just reflexively go grab him, have him come out. And it's only when I sat back down that I realized I was supposed to be dead. I was not supposed to survive that moment. Um, that was the intent of it. And had I, you know, in retrospect, number one, had I not just reflexively got him and had he not been in the car, I wouldn't be here. And number two, in retrospect, what's surprising is I think he was just as shocked as I was. Wow. Cause I think had he not, he would have just shot me before I got to the car. So now you have to take those little Lean Chi biases and couple them with those events. And that's just a singular event that's happened multiple times in my life. That's really what begins to change the conversation. So what conversations did you have growing up as a child and then as a young man in your family conversations, in your uh, friend conversations, et cetera, about how to tolerate and how to face up to some of these biases, what to expect? What were the conversations that were happening in, in rooms that I have no understanding of? You know, it's interesting. Let me think about that. I think growing up in part, so both of my parents have to live in two different worlds, right? They have their friend group, which is far more black. And then they had their workspaces in which they were pretty much the only black person. And so it's not even just what they taught me is that I saw that as a norm, right? That's to me, that was the kind of the expectation of life. I, I specifically remember being in fifth grade, sixth grade, and my mom and I going to the clothing store and I was looking at clothes and I wanted something. And she said, you can't have that. You have to dress better than other people to be viewed as their equal. And that's a pretty universal conversation amongst black people. It went from that to you have to be smarter to be viewed as their equal. You know, the way I talk, that's just the way my parents talk. That's, there's nothing magical or special about, you know, my vocabulary, my ability to enunciate words. That's just how we talk in our family. But there was the expectation of if you let your guard down and have any slang in there at all, which I could do very quickly because, you know, in my other world, all of my family members were primarily in inner city Detroit. And so... I can navigate that world just as easily as I can a boardroom. But, you know, if you slip up, you know, you don't have a lot of room for grace. So you have to be prepared for that. From a friend group, it was less because, because my parents chose to, because they chose, you know, a better life for me. We moved into predominantly white neighborhoods. And so growing up, most of my friends were white and with them, you know, it's funny, they didn't see color until it was time to go over someone's house, until it was time to date. Um, it was very specific times where we went from not seeing color to color was clearly there. I think in school, you know, I, I, you know, I had a rough time in elementary school. I didn't think I was going to make it. My parents didn't think I was going to make it. Um, and I had a teacher the end of fourth grade said, hey, I want to, the beautiful thing is, 
this teacher was a friend of my parents, so she already knew me. So she had already made some assessments. She said, I think I want to pull you into a special class. We're starting a gifted class. It's a special organization for academic research. And it's just going to be a lot of, you know, um, out of the box learning, logic elimination, things of that nature. And because she, what she realized is it wasn't that I wasn't intelligent or smart. It's just that, you know, I, I, I don't learn the way everybody else does. I'm very visual, three-dimensional thinking, very nonlinear in how I process information. So that pretty much saved me, fifth and sixth grade. But then we moved to another school district, and there was no chance of that. I wasn't getting put into gifted classes. There were no black kids in that. And so I, I remember that very distinctly. You know, I remember the awakening because I realized my parents had, whether intentionally or not, had been kind of sheltered from racism until I went to college. And that's when, it's not that I'd never been called the N-word before, but that's when it became far more normal. That's when, you know, I started to see the distinction of, you know, I was very used to having a predominantly white friend group and now I'm, I'm trying to navigate a space in which I'm used to my friend group being, you know, white, and yet they're not used to having black friends. And then I'm not used to navigating spaces that are primarily black for some reason. And so, um, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was an awakening, probably like what a lot of the world's going through right now. That was, that was my getting unplugged from the matrix moment. So, you know, those are the things I remember. And then I remember deciding to take black history. And that was kind of the other one. And, you know, my professor, Ben Wilson, we actually became really good friends. And he kind of took me under his wing. And I, I, it was just like the veil had been lifted. And black history was not just Martin Luther King, right, and George Washington Carver. But there was this whole narrative of history that, I'd, that had been hidden from me. And there was a an excellence that I'd never seen before. And, and it helped because I always thought I was an anomaly, right? I'm, I'm in a college program where I'm the second African-American to ever be in this program. I thought I was a statistical anomaly. I wasn't, I had just been separated from other people who were like me. And so I started finding ways to connect with people who were like me. So, you know, I mean, that, that's what I think of. I, I think I don't know that my parents intentionally did or didn't prepare me for any of this stuff, um, but I was fortunate that they had to navigate it so I could see what they did. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what comes to mind. You mentioned that almost defining moment of taking the conscious decision to study black history. And I think there's a lot of intelligence in that to say, well, actually, if I'm going to learn to navigate the future, the more I can understand the truth in the past, then I can find more empathy in other people's circumstances. What are hey, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. That, that's not how it went. <laughs> okay. me, so tell me, let that's, me where that. that's where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, let, let me fix that. So um, uh, I, be, I, I did what a lot of people are doing right now. I overreacted. Okay. I overreacted. I, I actually went from, from what I had just described to being pretty militant. I, okay was debating on joining the Nation of Islam, not because I believed in any type of doctrinal thing, and I still have, have some of their books on my bookcase, but I had far more respect for what I saw from the Nation of Islam than I ever saw from Christianity. I, you know, I, I could not wrap my head around the racist part of it, or at least the racist part from the people that I had interacted with, and so that was what held me back. But it wasn't nearly as much of a you know, I, I, this altruistic, you know, pioneering idea of how to navigate the future. It was, it was like, okay, so if I didn't know this, what else don't I know? And why did they hold this back for me? And I got to figure out myself. And it, you know, it started to mushroom and it took a few years for that to kind of, that bubbling up to start to come back down. But it was definitely a, it was a response to my awakening more than it was a plan for the future. Okay. But it did result in you being able to navigate the future more effectively 
because you went on the hunt for some truth in some way, whether that was anger fueled or confusion fueled or, you know, something that way around is you're like, I, I got to get after this and I've got to start testing some boundaries and, and maybe re-challenging things that you believe to be true. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what happened. Okay. Slight pivot in another direction is you mentioned earlier on about not wanting to be a speaker that ticks a box. There is an inherent bias right now that I'm very aware of in our profession and I'm very aware of in, um, in the corporate Western world as a, as a whole that feels the need that it has to box tick diversity across the board, right? In one way, shape or form, whether that's, you know, we need a black speaker in the lineup, whether it's, we need to be able to make sure that what we have done is, is we've changed our copy in a way that, that is feeling more inclusive towards other things is, is with your expertise around both bias and unconscious bias, what would you say to anybody in a leadership position right now that is thinking about box ticking in order to be inclusive or in order to be able to um, be seen to do the right thing? I would say that black people are more aware, sophisticated and nuanced than people give them credit for. Okay. So what happens is these things happen and they don't just happen corporately. They happen in relationships. They, we see it all the time. Just because people don't say anything doesn't mean they don't see anything. Right. So we have side conversations. We see what's going on. We, we talk about it. We're like, all right, here we go. Check in the box. You know how this is going to play out. Okay, which which one of the three of us is going to be asked to be on the uh, diversity panel? I mean, you know, we 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 have that conversation because it's that obvious, right? If you really want to make a difference, you need our voice and not just our face. So okay. it's time to actually get input from people of color, not just to if someone put on LinkedIn today. Don't have your only black person write your press release in response to all this going on as they're still suffering trauma from all that's going on because that's what's happening. So, you know, I, I think that that we're aware, <laughs> we're aware of our place in society. We're aware of our place in corporations quite well. We just don't let on you. You learn not only how to project safety, you learn how to remain safe. And so, you know, we can, we can pick that out in a heartbeat. Most people can. And just because we don't give that feedback doesn't mean we don't see it. So the checking of the box, you know, that's going to be vetted by people and people are going to make decisions without giving you feedback as to how they feel about it. What should a leader do if what they're looking to be able to do is to make sure there are holistic voices in the conversation they're looking to be able to understand the perspectives of all key stakeholders within the audience that they're looking to be able to serve. How, how should they approach this in a way that is authentic, is real, is, um, is delivering the objective that would matter to you? How, how should this be approached instead in your mind? Okay. Um, Okay, in any organization, you have what I would call opinion leaders. You have people who sit in the positions of, of leadership, and then you have who people really go to, right? And, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. the, right, that's the way it goes. Those opinion leaders have a better shot at getting in, input from these different intersections of diversity than the leader, because if this is something new, then they're going to view it as just not safe, right? I mean, it's... Yeah. We've, we've all seen a leader who goes to a leadership class and comes back and says, hey, I want to know, is there anything I can do differently as a leader? And the proper answer is, no, you're awesome. There's nothing. You, know, don't, you don't take that bait because most people can't handle that feedback, right? Right. I think you got to find safe people to begin to approach that because, number one, I, most black people don't feel like getting put on the spot in a way that they, they know everybody is gonna be questioning it. It's, my son was sharing this a couple of days ago. He was rem, rem, remembering when he was in high school 
and they were talking about something in black history and maybe they brought up Rosa Parks or Emmett Till or something and they're talking about it and he remembers all of the eyes turning onto him right because that's really what happens is all eyes turn to the person of color or the person who is the out group right the the disenfranchised person so you got to find the right people to ask but number two you got to ask you got to ask you might have to ask over and over and over again you have to make a safe environment you're not going to get the right answer on the first time that's not going to happen number three and this is i can't stress how important this is listen and shut up i mean it, it's people's defense mechanisms fascinating it's in fact let me take it deeper so I remember being in college and I was with one of my best friends, Andy. Andy's white, I'm black. That's somewhat irrelevant to the conversation, but you know, it it is what it is. And you know, he's still one of my best friends to this day. We went to a really nice steakhouse. I have no idea how we had money to go to a really nice steakhouse in college, but I was assumed that it's by legal means because that's how we roll. Anyway, so we're we're at the steakhouse and I'll never forget it. You know, we, we haven't even gotten our food. And someone over on the side is, you know, there's a couple of bartenders, waiters, wait staff, and someone, I believe was the only other black person in the place, sang because, you know, that was her talent. And she's singing and everybody's looking. And I'll never forget, she got done. And one of the guys who was off duty and finished the shift, he had been drinking. And he walked dead up to me and said, so are you going to sing or dance too? Now, that's me being the only other black person in the restaurant, right? I, you know, going back to what you said before, how do you deal with that? In the moment, because you don't expect it, I just froze for a second. I just, and it's probably the best thing, because I think if I hadn't, I would have attacked it. I think that that would have probably been at that stage of my life and my my demeanor and temperament, we probably would have uh, had a fight. And the fact that I had a steak knife on my table would have not been to his benefit. But I panicked for a minute, and then by the time I come, kind of come to, he's walked away. And I'll never forget the other people in the restaurant who saw it coming up to me and like, oh, I'm so sorry. And, and you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but as I've been in that type of experience over and over and over again, what I realized is way too many people in those moments the emotion that they feel is shame or embarrassment, which is self-focused, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of feeling empathy for the victim or indignation at at what happened, it's this, oh, they've internalized it and made it about themselves, which makes people naturally defensive. Yeah. So if you're gonna ask for input, realize it's not gonna all be what you wanna hear, but you can't be defensive and you can't make it about you and you can't say, you know, what about black on black crime or what about, you know, Chicago or what about the looting or what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, because at that moment we may not respond, but we've judged. We've realized this is not safe. There's no way I'm having this conversation with this person ever again. And we move on. And that's the challenge organizations have because They think of diversity in terms of, I've got to fill the pipeline, but they need to think of inclusion as, I have to patch the leaks. Because if you don't patch the leaks, you're just going to constantly be filling a pipe that has holes in it. So if I'm reading that, and I want you to correct me if I'm off base here, is there is often this outreach for diversity where leadership are approaching it like they're doing you the favor to give you the chance to be able to listen, that they are, you know, don't worry, I got you type, type thing. (sighs) Yet if they're doing anything to then suggest that this is not a entirely safe space, then what it does is it evokes a feeling of fear that then says, well, actually this isn't the time or the moment that you can feel confident to be able to step into that with a version of truth to be able to say what needs to be said. So often what happens is you choose to say nothing at all or 
to perhaps even box tick in the other direction to await another moment where perhaps there's a chance to be able to have the real conversation. A am I reading that right or am I missing something? You're spot on. You're spot and, and the choice that we face is we can either shut up and be silent or we can be viewed as an instigator and a troublemaker. We can be the angry black woman or the angry black man or whatever. And so that's the box that we're put in. And this is, you know, I talk to friends who are in all sorts of corporate leadership, all sorts of huh, government leadership, like we're talking presidential appointees, all sorts of military leadership. We're talking colonels, admirals, and generals. We're talking entrepreneurs, and it is universal. You know, you're, you, now here's the thing. You can always find that one or 2% it doesn't apply to. Okay, you can always sure. find that. But it's, it's pretty much par for the course. That's the, that's the norm, and everything else is the anomaly. So if I'm trying to think about how even in my decision making, I can do a better job of this is if I take the burden of fear instead and suggest that actually, instead of showing up defensive under the belief that I'm not biased and anything I'm doing could be providing opportunity, instead, if I show up with the fear that I might be biased and the curiosity to be able to find out some truth that I'm not yet aware of, then that level of vulnerability might mean, might lead to a more important discussion. That level of vulnerability might create an environment where more can get said than less can get said. Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually almost a binarily necessary thing that right. without that, you're not going to have anything. I mean, I don't know if that's the whole solution, but it's no, 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 no way. <laughs> Yeah, 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 but it's definitely... You know, we haven't uh, figured anything out. Yeah. Oh, we, we've <laughs> solved the world right there in one step. Just do this. Yes. Um, yeah, and you know, but you know, I want to come back to something you just said. You know, said if you take the burden of fear on yourself, that's the fascinating part. So many people that I'm talking to at this point who are very disoriented and, you know, I'm, people are reaching out to me out of all places and, you know... I will give a, another pointer on that in a second, but they're, they're coming from kind of everywhere. Yeah. And what's fascinating is there's a fear. You can see it. There's, you hear it. There's a fear of saying the wrong thing, of doing the wrong thing, of saying the wrong word, of, of you know, I, I don't want to be offensive. And so what it does, it's a weird thing, right? I'm, as a black male, I've spent my entire life trying to make white people feel safe around me, right? I mean, in, in all honesty, that's, well, wow. you know, I'm not a threat. And so now, <laughs> even in these conversations, I've got to make white people feel safe around me. So I'm not a threat. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But, well, I mean, no, it's the, but that's, that's the truth. That's the, the, the unfiltered what people aren't hearing truth that's that's the you know that's what we're all experiencing is that you know we have to and and we get it we understand it but that it's almost like no no it's okay to talk it's safe it's okay it's and it's it's almost like it's almost programmed into us the same way that it's programmed into women in the workplace to take notes during the meeting right? It's almost like that's our place now. And so it's, it's, it's fascinating. So right. You're so right. And, and, and I'm scared in this conversation, right? This is an unedited in interview and this will go out as is. And I'm scared of saying the wrong thing, right? I'm dancing around subjects in ways that, that right? I want to make sure that this is a, is a useful conversation. Yeah. And, and so can, can I say, can I address that? Offending. So again, yeah, 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 absolutely. absolutely. So I want to address that. I think here's the other part of it. So I had this conversation when I had text, Facebook, some kind of conversation. I don't know. I said, well, here's the deal. Look, we, we, I, I, I had my life threatened, right? I mean, it's like for real, for real. I've yeah. had my, 
you know, I thought I wasn't going to make it. I, I, I had a period of time that even growing up in a middle class family, um, I thought, yeah, if I can make it to 25, I did something. I mean, that's kind of the world and expectation we live in. So I say that to say, especially knowing you, but even if I didn't know you, for the most part, people can tell the difference between a sincere mistake and a malicious mistake. Okay. Right. That's the deal. It's, it's, yep. we can tell the difference. We can feel it. We, we, we know it. And if it's a sincere mistake, half the time, we don't even bring it up. Let me be <laughs> honest with you. We just like, yeah, you know, that's just where they are. It's like, it's like playing basketball with someone who's, you know, a little mentally slow. It's like, I can't call double dribble every time. You know, it's just like, you, you just right. like, you know, you that's the game we're playing, right? <laughs> right. That's it. So it's, so it's kind of like, dude, here's the thing. That person's got a great heart. Yeah. Okay. You know what? Down the road, you can address it, whatever. You can totally know the difference. It's not, it's not that way. I think um, there's this fear that people are going to overjudge. And I think it also comes from this playing the race card myth that it's an opportunity and i'm not definitely not saying that about you no no no, no. I, think I know you're not absolutely yeah. clear yeah. <laughs> but um there, there's that there but i think number one trust that people trust in the relationship right, right? like i kind of moved heaven and earth to have this conversation with you because it's you right i mean let's be honest with it. it's you there were my 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 schedule was pretty booked so to kind of slide this one a little bit later and move this over you know and we'll Thanks. have this conversation it'll be really good and, and I very much trust your intent. Trust that we're sophisticated enough, nuanced enough, and gracious enough to trust your intent. And that, and if we do bring up something, and here's the other really key part, if a person brings up something, they're doing so trusting that you're good enough to receive it. Because right. they know that that's the risk, right? If I bring this up, oh, here we go, right? I don't know how this is going to play out. So if, I, if, you, if you do something, I'm like, hey, you know what, Phil? You may want to rethink that. I'm approaching it because I trust in your goodness and your intent and that you're you know, the type of person who'll go, oh, wow. Even if you don't respond in the moment, that you're safe enough for me to bring it up. I think that's yeah. the other thing people have to realize. So I what you're saying though is that if you're going to enter into a conversation you've got to be prepared to also understand that you might not be right in, in any yeah. direction at any given point in time is that be accepting in the fact that you might receive new data and give yourself permission to change your own thinking when that new data gets gets received and to be able to think around stuff differently yeah and th that's kind of goes back to this idea of bias right in the, the yep. flawed algorithm because here's the reality. We are all wrong a lot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> a lot. Yeah, right. Even though we assume that we're brilliant and that we've grown and matured and are awesome, we're wrong a lot. And it's the seeking of new data because here's the real problem. Is the problem is not just that we're wrong. The problem is that we're wrong and then we look for confirmation to validate our, our rightness. And we may do that consciously or subconsciously. That's a, a type of bias, actually. But we look for things that validate the decisions that we make. And it's very hard to convince us both consciously and unconsciously that we're wrong. And so and that's honestly, Phil, the most crazy part of really digging into bias from a scientific standpoint. The more you study, the less confident you are about anything. <laughs> you know, it's just like, Dude, I don't even know if I'm if I really came into this world with any thoughts or if I'm just the product of my environment. It's it's really that type of thing. And so the more you can assume, hey, I'm wrong, I don't need to look for reasons to be right, I don't need to defend myself, the safer it is in a conversation. Um, the safer it is in you know, dude, you're married, you got kids now, you know, the safer it is in a relationship. If I'm not always you know, we've always, we, we probably, I don't want to say all, we've probably all been in an argument with someone where we got to the point where I forgot what I'm arguing about, but I just want to be right this time, right? I mean, we've <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. been in that, right? But, you know, our, our, our subconscious does that too. Like, damn it, I'm going to be right this time. And 
if we can approach the conversation of like, you know what, I'm just going to take whatever they say. And I, and I have to do this at times where I'm like, I don't agree with this at all, but wait, what if, what if they're 10% right? What if they're 30% right? What if I'm 10% wrong? And to start really reconsidering what people say, it makes a world of difference in the conversation. So there's a lot of topic in conversation right now around you know, people talking about Black Lives Matter, and then there's you know, this not counter argument, but this other voice, but yeah, but yeah, but all lives matter, right? Like this is a thing that is, is being clogging up my news feed for certainly the last almost week. And I'm trying to understand what is the data that is missing? Cause I'm not understanding the, um, I don't think anyone's saying that anybody's life doesn't matter in the, you know, that the all lives matter argument. I don't think when people are focusing on black lives matter, they're not saying other lives don't matter. What data is missing from people that are so strongly trying to, trying to expand, say something that is as focused as, as what black lives matter is into, yeah, but this is for everybody. What are some of the missing ingredients of data that are maybe affecting that bias? I don't know how much of it is data. I mean, we could talk about data okay. in a moment. I think there are just emotional, reflexive responses of not being included. Okay. I think there is a desire to believe that the world is more fair and meritocratous than it really is. There is, there, you know, I brought up this, this response to the idea of affirmative action before. But I do yep. think there's this belief that, you know, that person does not deserve a leg up compared to what I have. Um, I think that some of it is just total bull. <laughs> Honestly, I think. So, Why don't you, know, you just say what you really? If you're gonna really talk about it, you know, I'm sitting here dancing around this crap. Yeah. You know, some of it's just bull. Here's the deal. And I go back to the what about, what about, you know, when someone says, well, what about black on black crime? What about Chicago? What about the looting? What about, you know, if you say, well, what about Chicago? So here's my question. How much did you talk about Chicago before this moment? Because if you say, well, you know, I've been really following Chicago. I've been donating money. I, you know, I've, I've been part of this cause. Okay, then we can have a what about Chicago conversation. But if it's just a way for me to shut the conversation up, then it's a different animal. I mean, I don't know, let me use a different example. Let's say someone has three children. Uh, Bob, Joe, and Jill, just real quick, right? Bob, Joe, and Jill. But Joe ends up having this debilitating disease and has to go to the hospital all the time. They have to get special medication and special treatment. They have to go be put in, you know, they need to order a special bed for their room because they can't get up on their own and they have to have a, a worker come in all the time and, you know, check up on them, you know, three times a week because, you know, there's blood issues and there's, there's issues with, you know, just rehabilitation and, and learning basic motor skills. It would be absolutely crazy if Bob and Jill said, but what about us? Why don't we get the same thing? Well, <laughs> you don't get the same thing because you're not in the same situation. It's the most basic concept in the world. And so when people say Black Lives Matter, any response other than of course is questioned in my mind because yeah, okay, if you wanna say all lives matter, here's my question. When in history have all lives mattered? Was it in 1619 when the first slave ship arrived in the United States? Is that when all lives mattered? Was it in 1640 when John Punch became the first indentured servant to have to end up serving a lifetime of servitude and that's really the start of slavery? Was it after the Civil War, which was about ending slavery where slavery ended, but then you know, there were massacres of black people, especially when the first black senators were elected and they were literally murdered by white militias? Was it during 
the, the Jim Crow era? When exactly, because I'm, I'm confused, when did All Lives Matter? Because I've never seen it. I've never seen it in my lifetime. It's, it's not how, and that's, that's just a U.S. perspective. We can talk about Great Britain. We can go talk about Australia. We can kind of circle around the world, and it doesn't have to be black lives. Because you know what, you can go to parts of Canada, we need to talk about indigenous lives matter. I mean, it's just, take your pick. All lives have never mattered. The, the problem is, someone was really honest with me after class. So, teaching unconscious bias is quite the adventure. Because you get to, even though I try to present it in a way that's as, and when I say non-threatening, it's more in a, taking all of the stigma out of it so we can have the conversation, you still see people wrestle with it and grapple with it and, and say things that they have no idea that's what they really said or that's how it was taken. But I had a gentleman after, I was in Hawaii, and you know, it was a person who was a transplant who moved to Hawaii, we were talking afterwards. He said, I just have to ask this question. If we really make effort to level the playing field, as you say, and give, you know, special focus to, you know, other groups. If they win, who loses? That was eye-opening. Because I think in a lot of people's minds, this is a zero-sum game. And if you're already not happy with where you are in life, the thought that you could actually lose some of what you have so that someone else can be benefited? Nah, I'm, uh, no, that's not gonna happen. Until this thing affects me, I'm not playing that game. I think that's real. And I think people don't have any clue that it's not a zero sum game. And, and by doing that, for example, before, <laughs> before the pandemic decimated the United States, uh, most of the gains in the economy were actually traced back to inclusion efforts, especially women and white women in executive positions in the United States and then other diversity. I mean, you, the economy grew yep. because of inclusion and yet in many people's minds, it's if you get any type of, if we do anything to make up for the past and make things fair, then that means I suffer. And that's part of the mindset you have to deal with. That's the real deal. What's the difference between fairness and equality? <laughs> oh man, can I, uh, I'm gonna read, can I read you a quote? <laughs> yeah, sure. Because I actually talked about this during a Facebook Live. And this was a quote from a mutual friend of ours. In fact, let me do this. I am going to show you this quote, if you don't mind. Can I do that Go real quick? It. All yeah, right, yeah. check this out. I'm going to do it. Uh, I got my ECAM going. Can you see that? Yep. The great Tom Webster. The great Tom Webster. We were having this conversation. Oh, I got to move out of the way so you can see my big head. Um, the great Tom Webster had this, we were having this conversation last October, you know, about a month after we had all been, you know, you and I and a few others had been together in Toronto. And he said this. When a system is biased, fairness doesn't fix it. Fairness maintains it. I got to say that again because it was such yeah. a great thing. When a system is biased, fairness doesn't fix it. Fairness maintains it. Only unfairness in the opposite direction can rebalance an imbalanced system. So, and Tom, you know, he's a VP at a research firm. So he really talked about, talked about this from the standpoint of, you know. Almost just statistical, right? Just, just the yeah. statistical knowledge of data upon data upon data upon data is that, yeah, if the system, this makes perfect sense. If the system is right. biased, fairness doesn't fix it. Fairness only maintains right. it. So that, that's the problem is you can't now that we've had centuries of unfairness and centuries of bias say, okay, now that all the resources have been distributed, all the land has been distributed, you know, certain people have had, even though they don't view it as generational wealth, they've had the advantages of land ownership yep. and of, you know, access to health and everything. Now we're just gonna call it a day and make everything fair. It's like, 
but yo, we're running a race starting from different starting points. You can't do that. So that, that's the problem with now saying fairness versus equality or equity. Equity is yep. saying, hey, we're not saying we're going to take everything away from people or whatever. What we are saying is we have to, for a focused time, focus some of our resources in this area so that the whole can be better. It's just like, so in college, I had knee surgery from playing football, right? It's tore my left ACL. While it was healing and, you know, I had surgery and I'm on crutches, my right knee started to hurt because it was compensating for my left knee. Right. And it wasn't until my left knee got better that I was walking straight and both knees felt better. Th that's what happens is there was a strain on the other knee because this knee was hurting. I think, you know, I, I, and I had to wait until this thing got totally good to go for the whole body to be better. I think that's what we have to start thinking because if we don't, then this idea of being so altruistic and meritocratous has to be thrown out the window. You, you can't say it. And I'm not advocating necessarily communism or anything like that, but we know this with our own body. You know, if, if I go in to the doctor and say, oh my gosh, I think I broke my ankle. He goes say, okay, but let me check your uh, left arm first. Well, no, why would you worry about <laughs> my left arm? Clearly it's my right ankle. Yeah, 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 but no, 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 I gotta check, all joints matter. So let me check, you know, every bone and everything. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's focus on what's injured right now. And that's gonna make the whole thing work better. Yeah, okay, no, I get it, I get it. And I, and I think there's lots of things that I can do with that in my world in terms of being able to you know, amplify what's important and create opportunities that I maybe hadn't done in the past. And a couple more just quicker questions is, do you believe that the world and people of the world think that they are biased? No. Okay. Did you want more of an answer than that? <laughs> it was no, just... no. I, 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 okay. It's kind of what I thought you would say, and it's kind of what I thought too. So the world doesn't think that it's biased. Yet, we have data to prove that almost everybody is biased. If what we're going to do is to show up with less bias, which I think is probably the only objective that we can have at this stage, right? Is less bias, not no bias, but less. Mm -hmm. um, if you're thinking that you want to, and by you, I mean anyone listening to this right now, and, and by you, I mean me, um, wants to just operate with less bias in their world. How, how do we do it? Okay. Be, you know, and you're dealing with this awareness. So here, let me go back and answer that first question. Over. I think people intellectually believe that they're biased in theory, but they don't believe they're biased in practicality and in the moment. So, yeah, I'm probably biased in some form or fashion somewhere, but then, hey, I think what you did was biased. Yo, whoa, 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 I'm not a racist. I never said you're a racist. I said, I think what you did, yeah, but whoa. You know, so I think that's more of how it plays out. So what can people do? First, I do think you have to just become aware of that idea that you could be biased. And because what that does is that makes you stop in the moment and it makes you say, okay, you know what? Let me reevaluate the situation, okay? That's hard to do. So we're gonna to come to some other stuff with it. Two, expand your friend group and strategically expand your friend group. Just, you must, you must expand the friend group and the number of so associations you have. And like, let me give you a great example. So growing up, in a very religious area, in a religious household. I had a lot of issues with homophobia. That's just, it's kind of the nature of it, especially dealing with Christianity and especially Christianity in the United States. And I don't know, I can't speak to other countries. I realize that's something I gotta deal with. That's not something you can just, you know, play with, right? That's especially, if you want to eventually step into a space like this, but even beyond this, you know, it's when you're 
disenfranchised and you've been a minority, you have a special sensitivity to wanting to make sure you don't hurt other people who are going through that. So I started to think, okay, now I had been working on this for a bit, but then I became a speaker and I'm like, okay, there's a lot of people from the LGBTQIA community who are professional speakers. They just are. Why don't I know any of them? Right. Right. So I got into different circles. I'm in some circles that you're in as well. And all I did was I just started building more friendships in those circles. Now, let me say what I didn't do. I did not go out and get a gay friend. That's not what I did. Okay. I want to make that clear. I just said, you know what? Let me just befriend way more people, people that don't normally sit next to me, people I don't normally talk to and just started building friendships. Don't, don't. And, and what started to happen is I started building friendships with people and we started becoming close. And then at some point I realized, oh, I didn't know he was gay. I right. didn't know that he was trans, had no idea. All I know is they're my friend. And what that did is that begins to change it because now I can take all of those biases, whether conscious or unconscious, and I have some real live benchmarks with names that I can yeah. go and combat that with. Well, you know, gay people like that really well, and I'm not going to say their names, but this person, this person, this person, this person, this person aren't like that. In fact, are they only not like that? They're not like each other because most people are monoliths, right? So that's right. the easy stereotype to break. There's actually a lot of studies to show that that works. There's a study by a, a researcher named Rudman in which he did, he took four college classes and he said, okay, for, for two of the classes for one semester, they're going to take a general education class taught by a white female professor. And they've measured what's called their implicit association. There's an implicit association test that's created by Harvard. They took the implicit association before the semester began and after the semester began. And what they found out is that after the semester, this group was more biased towards white people. Not surprising, prolonged positive exposure. With the other two, they had them take a prejudice class taught by a black male professor. And a lot of the feedback that they received was, and we really like this person. He took a general, genuine interest in our well-being and in our learning and so on and so forth. And when they measured their implicit associations after the semester was over, their biases had been mitigated because of prolonged positive exposure. And so being around more people that you, know, you, you could do that with, that helps with your biases. And I'm going to take that back to something I said earlier. You know, I really looked at joining the Nation of Islam. I really looked at joining the Nation of Islam. And yet there were things that they were saying, um, and primarily about white people, especially where I was. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, but that's not true of this person, this person, this person, this person, because I had relational benchmarks already built in. So that exposure becomes really important. Um, the thing about exposure is you need to get to the point of exposure eventually where those people are comfortable enough to give you feedback as we talked about earlier. Yeah. The other thing, and this one's fascinating. So this one's, this we're going to, we're going to get into the science of bias on this one. Okay. So the other thing is accountability. Now from an organizational standpoint, people would much rather check the box and get real accountability for progress. Cause there's always a, well, we couldn't find enough candidates or this, or they weren't qualified or blah, 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 BS. So here's the thing about accountability. Now check this out. Daniel Hammermesh, at University of Texas at Austin. He analyzed every pitch in Major League Baseball from 2004 to 2006, okay? Let me say that again. He analyzed every pitch from every team in Major League Baseball from 2004 to 2006. And here's what he found. He found that white umpires, or actually, let me rephrase that. He found out that umpires were more likely to call a strike if the pitcher was of their same race. And because the majority of umpires were white and the majority of pitchers were white, guess who had an unfair advantage? Now, I, of course, as a researcher, I had to go back and check that out because that's kind of crazy. But here's the thing. There's this thing called affinity bias. Affinity bias is 
it turns out that when we view people who we identify with, we use the same neural pathways to think about them as we used to think about ourselves. Right. And so when we do something that's off, we go, yeah, okay, that was off, but that certainly is not representative of my character. You know, that was, there are mitigating circumstances or blah, blah, blah. We give ourselves a pass. Well, turns out when we see someone that we relate to, those neural pathways make us more empathetic to them and we give them more of the benefit of the doubt. Whereas if we see someone who's not that way, it's not that we're mean or cruel to them. It's, and this is critical, we are more subjective and by the book with them. And that's really what happens in the workplace too. So Daniel Hammermesh figured out there was this bias. And just to, to help everybody else, not only did they find out there was that bias, he also found out that umpires were more likely to call a strike for the home team pitcher as well. There really is a home team bias. In 2013, they repeated that study. And guess what? That bias was almost totally gone, completely mitigated. Wow. Now here's the thing. They didn't attribute the difference to training or anything else. They attributed it to that pitch monitor that you now see at the baseball games, right? Because now you have this big thing on the jumbotron where the umpire goes, yeah, he goes, ball. Everybody else goes, nope. <laughs> you know, it's like, no way. And umpires have said, because I know that's there, and because in the parks where it exists, we have to make sure that we have no more than a 10% margin of error or it affects our employment, that when there's a close pitch, I get off autopilot and I really make sure that I'm making the right call. See, there's something about accountability that where exposure changes and reprograms our biases, accountability can mitigate the effect of our bias. So, well, and the fact that there is no one person who is judged during execution or over a decision as well, some form of consequence panel. of getting it yeah. wrong. Right? Like if, if you're the whole decision and you get it wrong and nobody else has to live in that other than you, uh, in that umpire scenario, right? Like, like well, I, I say it's out, so it's out. Um, is different than I say it's out and computer says, ah, ah, right? Like that's a different thing. So what I'm learning in that too is the more you can align consequences to the decisions that could be impacted on bias, the less likely you are to be biased. So even just building in protocols that say there are checks and balances in my decision-making so even if that was a hiring process, right? What, what is it you say, here's my guy, here's my girl, here's my whoever, right? Like, what have you got as checks and balances behind that to say, yeah, but, and what else, and who else, et cetera. So if I'm trying right. to just summarize the, the, the three big things that you've said that could allow us to be less biased, is one I'm hearing is, is take a beat, catch a breath, like be curious enough on your own thought and, and be prepared to challenge yourself and say, what if I'm being biased here? Like, like just, just almost a mirror, right? Just a mirror held up to say, hang on, what if? Second thing is, what could I consciously do to surround myself with more people who think, act and behave differently to what I am so I can humanize, genuinely understand and empathize more about other people's perspective because I have new evidence that is real that I've shared experience with. And then the third biggie is, is checks and balances. What can I do to consciously ahead of time, accept the fact that I probably will be biased. So how do I create something that can second guess me afterwards and, and put that milestone into place? And I'm feeling if I did more of that, I would probably show up with less bias. I'm guessing you would as well. Okay. And same, same here. I would too. Mm -hmm. We could have this chat forever and we probably will do. So um, we will probably stop recording at some point, <laughs> but I, I have two questions that I'm going to be asking you everybody in this and, and they're two big questions. So ask, uh, answer them as big as you, as you would like. like this is a show about words and I want two words from you plus some um, explanation around. The first question I'm going to ask is about one of those words. If you could choose just one word to describe how you're feeling 
based on current events right now, what word might you choose? Exhausted. And why? This has been, number one, we've been quarantined for what, 10, 11 weeks. We're already living in this strange space that's, that's challenging in and of itself. And people are going through all of the emotions of mourning, you know, at different rates. We watched on TV as Ahmaud Aubrey was murdered. We watched on social media as Amy Cooper called the police on a black man who checked her for walking her dog without a leash three miles from my house. And then we watched the potential consequences of what that call could have been the next day as George Lloyd was murdered and we literally watched him suffocate for eight minutes and 53 seconds while he cried out to his dead mother. That was a visceral moment. We watched as had there not been protests, there may not have been charges. The whole world, we watched as people have tried to peace, to, pro, to protest peacefully. And we've watched agitators who have infiltrated that and it's all on video to make it seem like the protesters were rioting and looting, when in many cases it's not. And it's certainly, there's much video to show that it certainly is not all black people doing. We have watched police fire randomly into a crowd. We've watched people get sprayed with tear gas, which if you know anything about tear gas, that's not how you stop a riot, that's how you start a riot. We, so for myself and for many other black people, we are having a trauma response. This is PTSD at its core. And yet, I still have clients. I still have meetings. I'm averaging three podcasts to talk about it a day, which, you know, I'm actually glad this was more about bias because I feel like almost every podcast is a reliving of the trauma. We're getting reached out to very well-meaning people who want to learn. And so we're carrying the burden of teaching other people about the trauma that we're going through mm -hmm. uh, and then being patient with them as they're going through the learning process. At the same time, Last Thursday, my wife had to watch a video funeral of her aunt, who was her deceased mother's last remaining sister, because the week prior, her aunt and her aunt's husband both died of COVID-19 related issues. Um, we're trying to keep our families sane. Both of my kids are trying to express to their, to their friend group uh, A, what they need to be doing, B, what they don't need to be doing, and C, how they need to be thinking. Um, and I'm probably sleeping about three and a half hours a day. I'm exhausted. Okay. So let me give you a final question from the interview. I need another word. If we to look forward six, 12, 18, 24, 36 months on from now, and we were to find a word that would describe your idealistic, fair utopian adjective of how society is at that moment in time what might that word be the only word that comes to mind is willing hmm. i think it's unrealistic to expect that the world has changed in 12 to 18 months Although change can come fast, but it just doesn't always stick when it comes fast. I think the idea that we could live in a world that's 
willing to have the conversations, willing to see another person's point of view, willing to, as you and I talked before we started recording, willing to recalibrate their personal expectations of the future, willing to change their contaminated pools of information to battle them so that maybe they don't have as much bias, willing to deal with their own trauma, which is likely, I'd love to get into that for a second, maybe we don't have time now, but willing to deal with their own trauma, which makes them more susceptible to being biased and hurtful and hateful against other people, willing to have these conversations and to not just have it when a world event happens, but to have it consistently and in those conversations to be willing to be wrong, to willing to have their minds changed, to be willing to take action, to be willing to look at their young kids and say, I will go through discomfort now so that you can have a better world tomorrow. Will. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. Tony Chapman, how can people find out more about you, can learn more about how you might better help them? www.tonychapman.com, C H A T M A N.com. You could find me. I'm honestly on Facebook more than anything. Uh, I just, yeah. people don't like me on Twitter. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> it's just one of those like, I post on Twitter, like, eh, meh. Uh, so Facebook, Tony Chatman, and I've got both a personal page and fan page. Probably hit, the, probably hit the fan page because I'm doing lives every day about these types of topics. And, you know, LinkedIn, Tony Chatman, or worst case, if you reach out to Phil, Phil always knows how to find me. So that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say as well is, is Tony has produced one of the greatest books on leadership that I think falls in that undiscovered category, something that is full of great information about how people can be a more effective leader. I'd encourage you that if you are serious about how you can lead with more intent, how you can uh, lead a more fulfilled business and have better relationships with the people involved in that, then I'd highly encourage you to grab a copy of Tony's book, The Force Multiplier. It is a brilliant read with some great tools in it that make you think, act, and respond differently as a leader. Tony Chapman, thank you so much for carving some of your time out today to be able to talk to me here on Words With Friends. It's always a delight to be able to hang with you. Um, I look forward to continuing conversations like this and many others that we have. Maybe some on a lighter note at some point in time in the future. And um, thank you most of all for being my friend and um, making some time for some of these important conversations that I think need to happen. Appreciate you, my friend. Thanks. Uh, this was a great time. Thanks for your friendship. Thanks for your time. Um, we'll probably have an offline conversation with a little bit of bourbon in our hands and you know, <laughs> decompress. There's a lot more to catch up on, but thanks. Uh, and thanks for, you know, thinking about this. This was a shining star in a, you know, galaxy of podcasts that I've been doing recently. So, uh, you know, it's fascinating. So it was a really good time. Thanks.